Well, hello. Uh, my name is Thomas Easley, and I'm the director of the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine. And uh, I have been meaning for a while to teach some free classes and uh, kind of get some information out there that people have been requesting. And uh, I get a lot of requests uh, from other practitioners on a variety of subjects. And I thought that fatigue would be an appropriate one because uh, it's... Uh, it's so common um, in my practice to see fatigue as a symptom, and uh, it's, a, it's a common symptom if you're not a practitioner, if you're just a layperson. And I have a, um, an eight-hour class on fatigue that I teach, and so I decided to pull some of the best gems from that class and compress it into what I hope I can limit to an hour, hour and a half, something like that. Um, I can... Uh, flip screens and uh, see any questions that come up. So I will try to. Um, whoop! I will try to continue answering those. Let's see. I just got a pop up that said the presentation had failed to go live. So, if somebody wouldn't mind typing into the chat screen, can you see my screen that says the many causes of fatigue with our logo on there? Okay, so it's it looks like I'm live. Um, that might mean that the recording is not working. Gosh. Okay, so I'm just going to teach the class, and uh, if that means the recording didn't work, then you will be the lucky ones uh, that get to see it. Um, and I'll have to go back and redo it sometime later. Okay, perfect. So, um, okay. So, there's this um, there's this great symptom checker through Isabel Health, and you go in and uh, it, it's for uh, the average person to put in their symptoms and narrow down a list of most common things. And so, just out of curiosity, I went and entered uh, fatigue. Uh, with my age range, and I'm a male, and I came up with uh, a total list of uh, about 40 things. I then got curious and went to a few other symptom checkers, and uh, um, I think the most that I got, if I played around with the age, was around 120. Uh, so that sounds about right. Fatigue is a common symptom of uh, well over a hundred different disorders. And we can't possibly go through all of them, but what we can do is uh, focus on the ones that are most common. I should say we can't possibly go over all of them in a reasonable amount of time. I do attempt to go over all of them in uh, the clinical program that I teach. And uh, so let's just face it, like fatigue is super common. It's the second most common reason for a primary care medical visit with pain being the most common. And about 50% of people who seek medical help have a diagnosable illness and the other 50% don't. Now, that's really interesting to me because... Uh, to me, what that says is that about 50% of people get adequate medical care and about 50% don't. It's not that they don't have something wrong. It's that our system is so broken, it only identifies those people in, you know, like full pathological states of disorder instead of the people that are headed that direction but don't show up on the numbers. And so I think it's very important that we make an appropriate differential as to the cause of fatigue so that we can effectively work on it. There are a lot of medical causes of fatigue. This is the short list of the 100 plus 
uh, disorders in which fatigue is one of the first symptoms. Uh, and so what I like to do is uh, um, I like to kind of reduce that down a little bit more into some bite-sized pieces that we can get into tonight. Uh, so we're going to talk about fatigue from deficiency, fatigue from lifestyle, um, fatigue from pathology, uh, fatigue that is psychiatric. We will kind of glance over because uh, I did a, a really thorough webinar on depression. Um, oh, with Christopher Bennett, maybe that was a month ago or so. And uh, so if I have the information out there, I'm not going to repeat it because it was like a four-hour webinar. But we'll, we'll gloss over some of this and we'll go into detail on the things that I see most often in my practice. First off, I think anemia is really common. So statistically full-blown anemia as demonstrated by uh, lowered hemoglobin. I'm not just talking about like functionally low ferritin, but lowered hemoglobin is 10% of all premenopausal women with 20% of premenopausal uh, minorities that have a ferritin less than 10. So if you're in the functional medicine world, you know that ferritin is less than 30 and you start getting mild inhibition of the thyroid. Uh, you start getting good generalized fatigue well before the full-blown anemia occurs. Basically, uh, in your premenopausal uh, female population, if one out of every 10 people that you're seeing uh, doesn't have anemia, um, then uh, you're probably not looking hard enough. So one of the differentiations between the fatigue of anemia and the fatigue of, say, food allergies or any of the other numerous causes of fatigue is that people with uh, anemia typically wake up um, with fatigue. And uh, so this is even after a good night's sleep. And we're going to talk about sleep disorders. But, you know, if you get a good night's sleep, and you wake up tired, assuming you don't have sleep apnea, then anemia is the most common cause of that. Um, there are risk factors from anemia. Basically, you have uh, anemia from dietary insufficiency of a number of nutrients, not just iron. And then you have anemia from uh, malabsorption, uh, where you're getting enough in your diet, diet but not absorbing it. And then you have anemia from uh, blood loss. And uh, so here are the functional ranges that I use for anemia. I don't have these slides uh, available, but you can review the video and pause it on the screen and make notes. Um, basically, for iron deficient anemia, I think that ferritin... Uh, is a better early indicator than following, uh, you know, RBCs and uh, hemoglobin. Um, by the time your red blood cells and hemoglobin drop, you've probably already been experiencing fatigue for one to five months. Uh, so uh, keep the ferritin level over 30 for um, iron deficient anemia. Iron deficient anemia is the most common anemia in the world, and uh, we talked about some of these causes being dietary inadequacies. So you want to be on the lookout for that with uh, uh, people with restrictive diets, whether that's restrictive because of medical conditions or restrictive because of, because of choice or because of religion. Um, you know, if you don't eat red meat, it is uh, difficult to get adequate iron as a premenopausal female. Um, and uh, even if you are getting in adequate amounts, malabsorption, uh, you know, from celiac, yeah, what is it, 1 in 88, probably more prevalent than that. Some of the other malabsorption syndromes, uh, so you bring the total, uh, um, you know, significant malabsorption syndromes down to around 1 in 75, but then you also have hypochlorhydria or low stomach acid which is implicated in anemia and uh, then can lead to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, and that's a condition in which taking iron supplements can actually exacerbate. So we want to be sure that we're addressing digestive health. Um, hypochlorhydria 
is uh, uh, very common, especially in people that have GERD or reflux. It's normally from low stomach acid, not from high stomach acid. And of course, in anybody on a proton pump inhibitor or, you know, popping Tums or Rolaids, uh, they're going to have a suppression of stomach acid. Stomach acid requires a, a lot of nutrients for um, its production, but the three biggest ones are chloride, thymine, and zinc. And uh, a chloride deficiency is most common in people that on, are on restricted salt diets, uh, so they probably have high blood pressure. Um, a zinc deficiency is common in a lot of people because it's difficult to get enough zinc if you don't eat red meat, and lamb is the highest red meat in zinc, liver, organ meats, um, uh, or oysters, which are kind of the atypical source of zinc frequently. Um, and then thymine is a, a, a relatively common deficiency in people that are both paleo dieters and um, anti-pork. And those two do occasionally go hand in hand, normally from religious objection. And uh, so whole grains and pork are the best sources of thymine. And if you wind up uh, on a low grain diet and uh, you also don't do pork, then that's a you know pretty common deficiency. Um, then we have increased iron loss from bleeding and cancer. So uh, anemia in any male and anemia in a postmenopausal female is a red flag uh, warning sign. That person should uh, get to a doctor not next month, but within three days, um, preferably 24 hours. Uh, I have caught a number of cases of pretty severe anemia that even uh, regular doctors uh, missed. I had a, a student text me a picture of somebody's fingernails and they were pale and slightly flattened. And I assumed it was a female and said, oh, that person, you know, looks anemic. They should consider iron or that that woman looks anemic. She should consider iron. And the text message back was, this is a guy. And... Uh, uh, he's having some weird symptoms, and I called, and, you know, the guy had been to the hospital twice in the last three weeks and was experiencing dizziness upon arising, uh, um, pain in the stomach, uh, you know, stocking glove syndrome, tingling in the hands and the feet, and uh, the doctors had missed it because he also had a chest cold, so they gave him antibiotics and a steroid and never ran a CBC, and uh, so uh, I had my student write down his very specific set of symptoms that pertain to anemia and send him to urgent care, and he handed him the note, and they immediately got him back, and he had like four active bleeding ulcers, and he had a hemoglobin of like seven. So bleeding uh, anemia in guys is bad because you know we don't lose blood anemia and anemia in postmenopausal women is bad uh, anemia in premenopausal women much more common and then the anemia of pregnancy is fairly common because of increased iron requirements so optimal ferritin is uh, in between 30 and 90 too high it's bad because it increases your uh, risk of uh, diabetes too low is bad because you feel like crap. Your thyroid can't function, uh, can't convert actually is the bigger issue there. Um, and uh, so I like ferritin as part of a yearly uh, blood panel for people. And it's a, it's a pretty cheap test, you know, like I negotiated with a local walk-in lab and I can get a ferritin test for like 16 bucks done. Um, so it's a great test to run. You can do a physical assessment for iron deficiency. Physical assessments for the other types of anemia are a little bit harder, but basically what you're looking for is a pale tongue somewhat can indicate, um, can indicate iron deficiency, but pale gums are more indicative uh, because the body will maintain blood supply to muscles longer and the tongue is a muscle longer than it will maintain blood supply to the mucosa. Um, so pale gums and then you can gently pull down the lower eyelids 
And uh, I say gently because if you pull down hard, it blanches those little vessels underneath. But if you gently pull down the lower eyelids and look at the color of the red blood vessels beneath the lower, the lower eyelids, I think that's an even more sensitive indicator of iron deficient anemia than pale gums. Uh, those blood vessels start to turn pale quicker than uh, um, the gums start to pale. B12 and folate deficiency are also pretty common causes of uh, anemia. There's, there's like 100 plus types of anemia, maybe 400. No, I think it's like 100 plus types of anemia. There's a lot of different types of anemia. Um, and uh, some of them are genetic and hereditary, and you'll probably never see one in your practice. And some of them are from, you know, nutrient deficiencies like copper deficiency that's not that common, but has its own specific pattern. So I teach uh, classes on functional blood work, kind of from my own perspective. I did study uh, with Dick and Weatherby back in the day, and then spent a number of years, you know, focusing on my clients and recording all of their numbers and seeing what matched up. And uh, so the ranges are uh, are based largely on my practice, and uh, they differ from some of the mainstream ranges. I start looking for B12 deficiency uh, in uh, anybody that uh, sees uh, um, that that I see a MCV uh, higher than uh, 90 or higher, and MCH uh, 32 or higher. Um, of course, the symptoms of B12 deficiency uh, include fatigue, but they also uh, include neurological symptoms. I had a B12 level of about 210, oh, maybe six years ago, five years ago, something like that. And uh, my primary symptom besides fatigue was uh, phantom cell phone vibrations. Uh, so I felt like my cell phone was vibrating or ringing in my pocket and I would pull it out and there would be nobody there. And uh, so weird neurological symptoms like that, I'm always looking to the B vitamins with B12 being the primary one that I, I'm taking a look at because it's the largest of the B vitamins. By that, I mean it's the longest, most complex of the B vitamins and uh, the most difficult to absorb. Um, let's see, do I have, yeah. Oh, so let me talk a little bit more about B12. So B12 requires intrinsic factor to absorb. And uh, if they're not losing blood and they're getting adequate supplies of uh, B12 in their diet from either supplementation or from uh, red meat, any meat, but red meat specifically, um, then uh, you, you're looking at two basic really, well, one really common cause and one not uncommon cause of B12 deficiency. Um, uh, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and the symptoms are pretty common, uh, are pretty easy to identify. Anybody that experiences uh, significant belching or bloating uh, or GERD after meals, especially meals that are high in the FODMAPs, uh, in your fermentable uh, oligodisaturides, uh, polyols, and you know, I can, what's the M? Monosaturno? Anyway, fermentable sugars. Um, when you're eating starchy foods and you get bloating and belching, that's a very common sign of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yes, it can be a bloating from a lymphatic swelling because of the whole Peyer's patch and the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, but more often than not, it is a dysbiosis of the small intestines. And what the, those bacteria do is they actually secrete a B12 analog. So it looks like B12, but it doesn't act like B12 which then binds to intrinsic factor so that they can deconjugate uh, B12 from the intrinsic factor that your chief cells produced, and they can utilize the B12 for their health instead of you being able to absorb it. You get about 1% of B12 absorption passively without active transport, so without intrinsic factor. Um, and it's a really uh, a common deficiency. A folate deficiency is not that uncommon. Um, it's mainly from people that don't eat green vegetables because that's where you get folate from. And there are lots of different types of folate and folic acid is not folate. And uh, so you should try to get your folate or multiple folates from leafy green vegetables and organ meats 
Um, I don't believe that you should be daily supplementing with folate unless your folate, you know, your like serum folate is below um, below 10, you know, I like it above 15, but if it's strictly diet, no supplements, and it's above 10, I'm a happy guy. Um, and you can take bigger doses of folate, but be sure that you're getting in 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate uh, and not folic acid, which is the cheap reduced synthetic um, folate that... I guess it's probably better than nothing if you're a pregnant woman and malnourished, but increases your risk of cancer and uh, um, potentially all types of problems can occur. And a lot of people can't process folic acid into folate and then they get into all types of methyl issues. So uh, get your folate from foods. Uh, and if you must supplement, supplement with the correct form of folate. Um, a folate deficiency will uh, present with uh, uh, macrocytic anemia, so enlarged red blood cells. Your MCV will be 90 or above, your MCH will be 32 or above, uh, or you can test serum folate B12. You can test serum B12, um, but like I said, normally you'll wind up getting a, a functional shift in the size of red blood cells as they enlarge because they can't go through mitosis without folate and B12. They can't split and divide properly. So for low B12, uh, um, 5,000 micrograms of methylcobalamin sublingual. Uh, yeah, all of this comes from just a couple of manufacturers. Uh, as long as your supplement you know, isn't loaded down with uh, uh, fillers and junk, it really doesn't matter. And I'm not sure that sublingual is absolutely necessary. I read one study showing that um, intranasal administration of B12 worked, which kind of blew me away because it is such a large molecule and uh, maybe it's because they were using big doses. But if 1% of uh, B12 absorbs passively without intrinsic factor and uh, you need uh, you know just a few micrograms a day like three micrograms a day uh, you know one percent of 5,000 micrograms even if you chew it up and swallow it should get you more than you need in my experience if your serum B12 is 400 or over maybe 350 or over you can get by with oral supplementation um, if it's you know 350, 300 or below, you're probably better off having uh, injections to get you up, and then use supplements to uh, maintain your level, or you know eat. Now, the other common cause of um, B12 deficiency besides small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is the MTRR mutation. I was unlucky enough to have MTRR and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is why even eating red meat, you know, four or five times a week, my B12 was in the low 200s. Um, uh, and I will say that methylcobalamin injections worked brilliantly for me. I actually didn't feel anything on my first injection or my second injection. My third injection, I literally felt my stomach acid increase. I felt my brain fog clear, and I didn't even realize I had brain fog. I thought that I had been functioning at full brain capacity my entire life, and uh, I probably had a B12 deficiency for a really long time. And man, um, the the rate and ability of my cognitive function just increased dramatically within five minutes of my third shot. So if you've got a severe deficiency, you know, don't screw around. Get um, get a good uh, primary care to prescribe you a compounded methylcobalamin. Um, by the way, that's a really handy way to find a good doctor. Call your local compounding pharmacy and ask them which doctors prescribe methylcobalamin. And uh, a doctor that prescribes methylcobalamin injections is probably going to be naturally minded into some form of functional medicine, integrative medicine, CAM, naturopath, you know, whatever the latest word for it is. Um, I like big loading doses of B12. Uh, you can get B12 compounded all the way up to 25 milligrams a milliliter, so you only need 0 0.1 milliliters of it. But it's harder to do and more expensive for the pharmacist. So I like um, 10 milligrams per milliliter of methylcobalamin. 
a lot of pharmacies will uh, give you individual shots of 0.3 milliliter um, milliliters in a syringe. Ask your doctor to write the prescription for a multi-dose vial and grab some insulin syringes, the little short baby insulin syringes, you know, off of Amazon and fill them yourself and you'll often save 50% um, uh, just because the pharmacy doesn't have to go to the hassle of pulling up each individual dosage that you're going to be doing. And sub-Q works fine for these. You can use the shorties. It doesn't have to be IM. So uh, there are other deficiencies that can cause fatigue beyond anemia. And uh, I want to talk about those a little bit. Vitamin D deficiency uh, um, can cause uh, fatigue as one of the first symptoms. So if you're a kid, you wind up with softening of the bones, you get rickets. Um, in adults, you wind up with a milder form of the disease with the fatigue and low back pain being the most common symptoms followed by muscle weakness and bone fragility. So basically, you wind up fatigued, so you don't exercise, you're not building your bones, you don't have enough calcium to build your bones because you're not absorbing it from a vitamin D deficiency, uh, and uh, you wind up with uh, you know muscle pain and low back pain, which kind of exacerbates the whole um, process. So low back and thigh pain is common. The pain is symmetrical, non-radiating, uh, uh, and uh, normally spreads um, to uh, the long bones first. There's proximal muscle weakness, so there's difficulty in climbing upstairs and getting up from a squatting position. And uh, this occurs pretty commonly. Um, basically, people start to develop the muscle pain when uh, their, or the muscle weakness, when their vitamin D levels fall below 30. And uh, they start to develop the low back pain when their vitamin D levels uh, around 16. Like 50% of people whose vitamin D levels are 7 will have uh, chronic low back pain. Um, but it starts at around 16. And that's pretty common in the winter time to get vitamin D levels that low. Um, so uh, they found uh, that the overall prevalence of vitamin D deficiency as defined as less than 20 nanograms a milliliter was 41.6% with the highest rate seen in uh, blacks and Hispanics. And it was more common in those who had no college education, were obese with poor health status, hypertension, uh, low HDL, and uh, not consuming milk daily. So, uh, minorities uh, and uh, low income are especially prone to this, but it's like half of everybody um, or close to half of everybody has vitamin D of less than 20. My primary practice for years has been uh, right outside of Pensacola, Florida, where, you know, we get cold for a month and a half and the rest of the time people are on the beaches getting sun. And so I have seen thousands of people uh, and checked vitamin D levels and uh, I have seen three people in my practice that had adequate vitamin D level from sun exposure. Um, and I define adequate vitamin D level as over 40 nanograms a, mill a milliliter. So that's because vitamin D is produced on the skin and absorbs in. It takes 24 hours for full absorption. So you go lay out in the sun and then take a shower and you're washing it off, uh, or at least some of it off. Um, uh, you know, sunning to burn level can produce about 50,000 IUs of vitamin E. Uh, 20 minutes of, uh, of uh, full body sun exposure produces about 20,000 IUs of vitamin D. Um, but then, you know, we also have to take into account that VDR polymorphisms are pretty common and, and people utilize vitamin D differently. So this is one of the tests that I think should be done at least yearly, preferably in the winter time to see how you're doing, whatever your winter time, you know, keep your winter time, um, vitamin D level above 40 
and your summertime level will probably be okay assuming that you're getting any type of uh, um, any type of summertime sun exposure magnesium is another really calm magnesium deficiency is another really common cause of uh, fatigue um, suboptimal magnesium intakes occur in greater than 80 percent of the population um, that's basically because we've had this huge increase in empty calorie foods and a depletion of magnesium in our soil um, there are, you know, uh, there's extra excretion of magnesium and utilization of magnesium in uh, people with insulin resistance. Um, you know, how do you know that you're vitamin D deficient and magnesium deficient? If you don't supplement and you're breathing today, then you're probably magnesium and vitamin D deficient. So, uh, you know, I, I don't like sweeping... Uh, statements and across the board recommendations but like you should probably supplement with vitamin d and magnesium um and if you think you shouldn't get your blood level of vitamin d checked get your rbc magnesium checked uh, i've seen people pull off healthy rbc magnesium levels with diet but most people feel better with the uh, extra magnesium it doesn't have to be a crazy expensive supplement and uh, we'll talk about supplementation at a, in a second I, I also wanted to point out because we're going to be talking about the role of mitochondrial health that magnesium stabilizes the third high energy bond in atp um, uh, basically meaning uh, that you have to have magnesium for energy production at the cellular level um, in between 100 and 1,000 milligrams a day in divided doses, depending on your intake from food. Typically, the sweet spot is somewhere around 4 to 600 milligrams. Um, I like magnesium glycinate. It offers the best absorption. But for like $10, you can make up six months worth of uh, uh, magnesium with plain, unflavored milk of magnesia, um, uh, 4.5 uh, um parts of vinegar to one part of uh, milk of magnesia and uh, what you're doing there is creating this nice little chemical reaction where the magnesium is freed from its um, alkaline salt into a free ionic mixture um, and uh, it, uh, if you like the taste of vinegar then that's great if not you add lemon or lime to it you know, about a tablespoon of that added to a quart a day, sipped slowly, works amazingly well. There are a lot of places where the water provides uh, adequate magnesium. They're, you know, high magnesium uh, mineral water. And so I think that kind of recreating that with the, uh, a couple of cheap ingredients and some science experiments uh, can be a, a good way to increase magnesium levels uh, then we have uh, the topical absorption of magnesium via magnesium chloride oil or epsom salts magnesium sulfate i found one study one time that showed that magnesium sulfate in the form of epsom salts um, increased cerebral spinal fluid magnesium levels uh, within a week of taking a 20-minute bath with two cups of Epsom salts in it. I didn't save the study. I, I now have a better system for uh, filing uh, important bits of information like that, and I've not been able to find the study no matter how much I looked. So um, I think that you can deliver magnesium topically, uh, though the mechanism for that and distribution is kind of uh, controversial. Um, I feel better when I take Epsom salts baths. I feel more relaxed and, it, you know, it's different than, it's a more of a relaxed feeling than the same, you know, temperature bath water without the magnesium. And uh, so I can only assume that you are getting uh, magnesium absorption topically. I do think internal supplementation is uh, important as well. Um, so low protein diets can cause fatigue and in fact, um, increasing protein in the diet reliably improves fatigue across the board. About 50% of people don't get 
their RDA of protein some point in their life, 60% of women. Um, and I really think that the RDA of protein is uh, inadequate. Somewhere between um, 25 and 30 grams of protein uh, in a low-carb breakfast is a nice starting place. And then for people with fatigue, somewhere around uh, three quarters of a gram of protein per pound of body weight or 1.6 grams per kilogram uh, is uh, an amazingly fast way to increase energy levels, probably because uh, most good protein sources uh, have uh, um, a lot of uh, essential nutrients in them as well. So uh, lamb is one of my favorite medicinal foods uh, of all of the red meats. I think it probably is uh, the best as far as trace nutrients go. It's got a nice amount of iron. It's got a pretty decent, you know, 15, um, that should say milligrams of zinc, not grams of zinc, um, uh, adequate protein and uh, it's tasty the fatty acid profile is nice the carnitine in it is nice and, and carnitine is one of the substrates for um, the Krebs cycle so it works really really well now uh, so let's see would I say that magnesium malate is better for mitochondrial issues um, I don't know that it matters uh, I've I've not seen any study differentiating uh, the different types of magnesium specifically for mitochondrial health um, so I don't know. It, it might be the best one, um, and I think that malate absorption is only a couple of points less than, you know, than glycinate. It's around the same level as citrate, I believe, somewhere around 20, 21 percent. Um, so, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, if mitochondrial dysfunction is by far the the leading concern, then try it or, or experiment with different types and see which makes you feel better. Um, so here's the thing that you won't hear me say when somebody comes to me with fatigue. You have adrenal fatigue. And uh, you won't hear me say that because I said that for 10 years. Um, and uh, I, you know, I bought into uh, the concept of adrenal fatigue, uh, which has, you know, some interesting correlations with the yin um you know yin deficiency or yang deficiency or kidney kidney yin deficiency probably most closely in tcm though i'm not a tcm person um but the the fact is that it's difficult to change uh, adrenal hormone testing whether it's saliva or blood and i've done both extensively with thousands of clients it's difficult to change those tests without supplementing with hormones. Um, and what I found is that I could get people to feel better and their tests still be outside of the quote functional norm. And so what I believe is that the adrenal glands uh, are correlated with fatigue and specifically adrenal gland imbalances of DHEA and cortisol are uh, uh, correlated with fatigue but I don't think they're causal in fatigue now you can make somebody feel better by giving them DHEA and sometimes giving them low doses cortisol but I find that that doesn't get to the root of the problem that in reality the adrenal glands uh, uh, become dysfunctional, not become dysfunctional, produce hormones in a dysrhythmic manner when somebody is fatigued because they are pushing themselves and it's the overreaching from fatigue that creates the DHEA cortisol pregnenolone imbalances um, instead of the adrenal glands creating the fatigue. 
So uh, the if you'll, and I know I've got a lot of, of really brilliant practitioners on the forum, I really encourage you to look at the studies that the textbooks and, uh, and experts quote when they talk about adrenal fatigue and read the full text of them and not just the synopsis and uh, see if you don't arrive at some similar conclusions um, as I did. So uh, after about 10 years of practice, I went through a really big uh, reassessment of uh, everything that I held to be infallible, uh, my sacred cows. And it was part of a master's degree program that I, um, I was in. And it was a really a brilliant thing for me to do. And I found that a lot of the things that I had uh, believed uh, didn't have a lot of science behind them, which doesn't concern me because I don't think that science is the end all be all. But when I started looking at my case histories and uh, looking at clients and their saliva ranges and their blood ranges and, uh, you know, and seeing how they had improved or declined and how that really didn't seem to correlate that well, it, it threw me for a loop. So then I started digging into the literature more and uh, um, I believe that a lot of the ideas about adrenal fatigue are ideas of convenience because people feel better when we throw adaptogens at them. I say adaptogens and I have this these air quotes going here. You can't see those. Um, in reality, most adaptogens are stimulants. There is not a lot of difference for people that are fatigued between caffeine and ginseng, between L-Ruthro and American ginseng or Korean ginseng, um, they almost always enable the unhealthy lifestyle habits that caused the fatigue in the first place by allowing people to overreach more which isn't our, our goal. Now, you know, like I, I was in Haiti after the earthquake, six days after the earthquake, and I popped El Rufro and uh, ginseng capsules and, uh, you know, threw on nicotine patches and had powdered caffeine with me. And uh, I pushed my body to the limits. I was getting one, two hours of sleep a night for a couple of weeks. Um, and I knew that I was doing that and uh, I rested and recovered and it took a couple of months afterwards. So I think that's what we should really be emphasizing when we talk about giving people adaptogens is that there's no such thing as free energy. And uh, you give somebody, you know, a reasonably strong dose of l -Ruthro. and And by the way, the doses of l -Ruthro used by the Russians in their studies were upwards of 16 grams a day. They used a uh, 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 two to one or a five to one concentrate of l ruthro and gave big doses of that. And uh, in the studies that the Russians did uh, uh, on their soldiers with l ruthro it produced insomnia and anxiety in over 50% of them. So uh, when you're giving, uh, you know, the, the doses of l ruthro or the doses of ginseng uh, that combat fatigue, be concerned about facilitating a future overreaching. So what I think is actually happening is that people are experiencing, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, not like full-blown mitochondrial disease, mitochondrial myopathy, but functional changes or dysfunctional changes in the mitochondria. Uh, and uh, so... Um, Oh, uh, let's see. Diane says the webinar just started over. I hope not. Um, it might be the recording that just started. I'm not sure. So, anyway, let's let's take a look at the Krebs cycle. Basically, uh, y you get uh, acetylcoenzyme A from glucose. Uh, here, let's switch here. Um, I don't have a highlighter on this software. So uh, let's look at the top left hand corner where we have a glucose. And uh, what we're seeing here is the glycolysis of uh, 
uh, of glucose to uh, deliver to pyruvates. And what you aren't seeing is that that glycolysis requires B1, B2, B3, and B5. And so in people that have a high carbohydrate diet, they have an increased requirement for B vitamins because they're producing ATP primarily from glucose. And um, what you will also find is that, oh gosh, let's see how to say this. Um, so B3 is niacin. Your body produces uh, about 40 to 60% of niacin from the conversion of tryptophan. Tryptophan is an amino acid that's found much more in animal proteins than in vegetable proteins. Um, when you're doing a high carbohydrate diet, you have an increased need for um, niacin because uh, glycolysis requires uh, niacin. When you have an increased need for niacin, your body prioritizes energy production over mood. And so what you wind up with is your body gobbling up all of your tryptophan uh, for the glycolysis process. And uh, then you're forcing the release of serotonin with your high carb sugary meals and you're not getting a quick enough repletion of that serotonin because of a tryptophan deficiency because of the high carb meals. Um, so uh, you really need to look at um, glucose balance and carb intake with fatigue because of the increased need for B vitamins. Um, and then on the other side of that, you have L-carnitine. So by increasing the protein in your diet, uh, you're getting more L-carnitine. You're allowing more production of acetylcoenzyme A from the L-carnitine. By, by decreasing the carbs, you're freeing up the B vitamins um, so that you can produce more energy at the cellular level instead of wasting them with glycolysis. I'd also like to point out that uh, high carbohydrate diets not only use up more B vitamins, but specifically in the case of niacin, high carb diets can uh, um, actually slow down the absorption of niacin, just like consuming alcohol can. Uh, so, Oh, y'all's this chat is funny. I've got to stop looking at that. Um, so you've got the, the requirements for B1, B2, B3, and B5 uh, with glycolysis. Then you have it for the conversion of pyruvate into acetylcoenzyme A. And then it enters the Krebs cycle. And uh, so there are more nutrients than on this chart. Um, for instance, your first, second, third. So see this ATP bond that's highlighted yellow down here? This is the ATP bond that requires magnesium. And uh, if I remember correctly, it's the most productive. Uh, the ADP to ATP is uh, the most productive um, of the conversions. So you don't go through all of these conversions in every cell. Uh, and then you have requirements for iron, which aren't on the list. Anyway, you have a whole lot of stuff. And, uh, and yes, you do have that requirement for malate. And maybe that's where, you know, doing uh, the, um, do, doing the magnesium malate might come in handy. Or, you know, you could get malic acid from eating an apple. Oh, there's the iron. So anyway, you got a lot of nutrients required for the Krebs cycle, uh, which is how your body creates energy. Um, vitamin D is also uh, involved in mitochondrial function in people that had severe vitamin D deficiencies. Uh, um, uh, where their vitamin D was 10 or less. By the way, I had a student last week who had her vitamin D checked, and it was 5. Um, and I've seen a 3 before as well. 
So vitamin D levels increased ATP production by 20% in a linear fashion proportional to the increase in vitamin D status. Um, additional things to consider about, about mitochondrial function is uh, we weren't designed to eat every day. And I know that that is unfathomable for a lot of people, but our bodies were designed to not only endure, but there are evolutionary processes that are beneficial that occur when we fast. One of those is called autophagy, where you get dysfunctioning mitochondria, uh, and when you fast, after about 36 hours of fasting, your cells actually begin to push the dysfunctioning mitochondria to the outside and uh, they're they're basically gobbled up um, and replaced with brand new mitochondria and uh, so uh, for people that are having fatigue and getting adequate nutrient intake so you never food is inherently building okay so i practice the abc plus d approach uh in which building the body is uh, essential and, and building the body involves primarily nutrition preferably from food um, if food is inherently building then the lack of food is inherently cleansing and I, I want that to sink in for a minute because you know if you're in the herbal world especially if you've been in the herbal world for a while you've heard of cleansing and you know let's take uh, these anthraquinone glycoside containing herbs to cleanse the colon and uh, let's do uh, you know these berberine containing herbs to force phase one detoxification and cleanse the liver and let's take these diuretics to cleanse the kidneys and uh, really it's all like bullshit 1980s herbalism um, and we really have grown past that but there's still some people not catching on um, you, if you want to cleanse the body, the body has built-in mechanisms to do that, and they require adequate nutrients to do that. So uh, put somebody on a nutrient-dense diet for three months or six months, and then ask them to fast uh, one day out of the month. And after they've been doing that a couple of months, ask them to fast two days every other month. And uh, within a year, you will replace all of your dysfunctioning mitochondria and your energy will be out the roof and you won't die if you don't eat i promise um i i have uh, uh, you know an uh, Al alcat mutation my body doesn't produce energy from um fatty acids very efficiently at all and i did a 14 day water fast when i was in my early 20s I, I didn't do it just for the heck of it you know or or arbitrarily i built up to it i fasted one day every three weeks and then i fasted uh, you know two days out of the month and then i increased it to three days and then i increased it to seven days and then just to see what would happen i i did a 14 day fast and uh, I didn't lose, uh, you know, tons of weight. Um, you know, maybe I think I, I lost 15, 16 pounds, um, but somewhere around 10% of body weight. And I felt great. Like after day 11, I felt like I could do it for a month if I had to. It's a good way for mitochondrial health. And it's one that's not talked about because it requires sacrifice on the part of the person doing it. But the payoff, the benefit is just amazing. Um, don't fast somebody that's malnourished. They really need to be on a good building program uh, for at least six months before fasting. Don't fast, don't fast anybody that's underweight. Don't fast anybody with a history of eating disorders. Don't fast anybody that's anemic. Um, and, uh, and start with short fast. Uh, okay. So, B-complex vitamins support the Krebs cycle as we saw. I don't like giving people massive doses of B vitamins 
mainly because most of it's wasted, most of it's excreted. And there's this whole like, yeah, your body will hold on to what it needs. And, and that's true to some extent. What I find is that if you need to supplement with B vitamins, uh, you probably need to supplement across the board for a short time. This is the uh, multivitamin that I take. It's uh, one multi from Pure Encapsulations. Um, two capsules. Uh, so one capsule has 2,000 IUs of D in it. Oftentimes, if people are multinutrient deficient, I will put them on two capsules a day of this. So it covers their vitamin D. 4,000 is on the low side. I might give them an extra 10,000 a day for a month and then 4,000 to maintain. Um, it has a small amount of uh, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, uh, B6. It has a decent amount of folate in it, especially if you're taking two a day, you're getting eight, 800 micrograms a day. It's got methylcobalamin in it. And then it, it also has the activated, you know, it's got uh, riboflavin 5-phosphate and pyridoxal 5-phosphate P5P in it. Um, it's got uh, 25 milligrams of zinc, so two a day for a month, you're getting 50 milligrams of zinc, more than adequate to uh, correct uh, zinc deficiency normally. Um, selenium, uh, you know, it's even, you're, if you're taking two a day, you're getting 100 milligrams of CoQ10, great for the mitochondria. Um, if you've got a mitochondrial problem, you know, you need to dig for it if it's not just deficiency and you can have mitochondrial problems from heavy metal poisoning and have mitochondrial problems from uh, glycophosphates and you can have mitochondrial problems from gut dysbiosis and lipopolysaccharide uh, absorption and all types of stuff but most of the time it's just shitty diet that causes it and uh, so uh, you know getting the body filled up on nutrients preferably from food and remember that supplements are supplemental to a healthy diet not they don't replace a healthy diet um, then that's fine. I don't take this vitamin every day. I I probably get in three capsules a week, which I feel is adequate to supplement my diet. Um, I know that I, I have a hard time getting enough zinc in my diet. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm compound heterozygous MTHFR and I'm MTRR, so I burn through B12 and I don't utilize folate well. So, you know, Supplementing, uh, minimal supplementing uh, is my recommendation so that people get used to feeling good when they eat real food, not when they pop pills. So besides deficiency, we have some lifestyle causes of uh, fatigue. Uh, sleep debt is one of the biggest of those. Um, you have to have... Uh, uh, adequate sleep to produce a growth hormone. Now, don't quote me on this, but if I remember correctly, it, it takes something like six hours of uninterrupted sleep to start really cranking out growth hormone. Maybe it's five hours. You know, still, it's it's like there's a pretty big percentage of people that sleep five hours or less a night in the um, in the New York um, study of like the thirty thousand nurses. Uh, I think it was 15% of nurses slept five hours or less a night. Uh, I just, I can't fathom that because I'm, I've always been one that needed my sleep. Um, so you need sleep for repair. If you don't get sleep, your body doesn't repair. It jacks up your cortisol, jacks up your adrenaline. You wind up in breakdown mode instead of build mode, even if you're eating a healthy diet. Insufficient sleep syndrome is just a uh, uh, nice medical way of saying uh, you aren't getting enough sleep and it's your fault. Okay. Um, now, people might not realize that it's their fault, but insufficient sleep syndrome is 100% client controlled. It's normally because they aren't scheduling enough time for sleep and they have poor sleep hygiene. So we talk a lot about sleep hygiene. I teach this class called the BTGs, the Basic Therapeutic Guidelines. And, and we talk about uh, sleep hygiene, uh, you know, for probably two or three hours uh, as part of this class because uh, it's vitally important. I don't have a problem with uh, a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, but if you have insomnia, you shouldn't drink coffee, period. Caffeine can affect sleep architecture for 10 to 12 hours. Uh, you, you also shouldn't drink coffee if you have um, um, not just insomnia, but anxiety. 
Um, alcohol can cause frequent arousals and is associated with sleep apnea. I don't know about the sleep apnea part on the personal side, but um, when we moved to North Carolina, you know, our best friends moved from Michigan uh, down here to help us get our educational center, our school up and going. Um, and, uh, and Brian, you know, one of my best friends uh, lives his house is a hundred yards from mine and uh, we'd oftentimes all get together and have one side or a night. And after like a month, I realized that I was waking up fatigued, even though I was getting my like scheduled nine and a half hours in. Uh, and uh, so I cut out the alcohol, totally got rid of it. And that, that wasn't even insomnia. That was just waking fatigued with adequate sleep. Um, so, beware sleep problems as a cause of fatigue. In 1900s, the average uh, uh, American slept nine hours. In 1963, it was 8.5 hours. In 2002, it was 5.9 uh, on weekdays and uh, eight hours on weekends. Uh, so uh, 6.9 to 7.2 hours per week. And uh, sleep debt causes fatigue, cognitive decline, cortisol cycle problems. Uh, Recovery dose, uh, and I learned this from Paul Bergner, who is brilliant about all things, but especially uh, um, his uh, very practical approaches to uh, sleep problems. 10 to 12 hours a night of bed rest uh, for three nights. If that doesn't replete you, then you know reconsider or consider a longer trial. If somebody has chronic fatigue, I put them on 12 hours of uh, uh, bed rest every night for 14 days because in one of the largest studies of its kind uh, ever done uh, they uh, confined a thousand people to 12 hours a night in a dark room and uh, sorry 14 hours a night in a dark room and the majority of them the first few nights slept 12 plus hours a night and then as they repaid their sleep debt they slept less and less so that the end of the study which was I think close to a month long, the average person was sleeping nine to nine and a half hours a night. And that is the natural sleep cycle. If you will have short-term sleep debt, your thy thyroid hormone levels uh, uh, rise. So uh, TSH levels uh, uh, rise within uh, four days. Uh, um, the amount of growth hormone that you secrete is reduced. Cortisol becomes elevated in the afternoon. So, you know, we do these salivary tests and we see cortisol dysrhythmia where it's not really like bottomed out Addison's disease and it's not really like jacked up methamphetamine addict, but it's just irregular. And uh, I think sleep debt is the biggest contributing factor to this. Um, Cortisol suppression of ACTH is, is blunted, and there are multiple measurements of insulin resistance that go off when people um, experience sleep debt after just four days. The most common cause of, uh, uh, of elevated uh, morning cortisol, waking feeling anxiety, or waking not fatigued besides anemia is a sleep apnea. Um, And uh, obstructive sleep apnea is the most common of those. Uh, uh, because we still have a lot of information to get through, I'm just going to kind of run through these quickly. If you have a fat neck and you snore, you probably have sleep apnea. There is a, There are mouthpieces that work for mild to moderate sleep apnea. A, a CPAP machine works for moderate to severe sleep apnea. About 50% of cases of sleep apnea uh, can be reversed if you lose 10% of your body weight, assuming that obesity and having a fat neck is the biggest cause of your sleep apnea. Um, if you don't want to spend the money, uh, if you don't have insurance and can't run a sleep study, you can get a O2 saturation monitor that records for 12 hours um, for about $60 online on Amazon. The software is clunky, but you tape it to your finger and you can measure DSATs. There's some uh, uh, O2 monitors that you can get that plug into your iPhone. There are apps for smartphones that measure, you know, how often you toss and turn. Lots of ways. Um, 
make sure that people are getting plenty of bed rest. Eight hours of bed rest will yield about seven and a half hours of sleep, anywhere from seven to 7.9 hours. Um, so uh, people normally misreport bed rest as sleep. So you need to ask not how many hours of sleep you get at night, but what time do you normally go to bed? And what time do you normally get up? And how many times do you wake up at night? Um, so uh, recommend more bed rest, you know, 10 hours a night in a dark room, no TV, you know, and in, in bed. And recommend that instead of, well, you know, you should get your eight hours of sleep a night. Uh, Self-reporting on sleep, 669 young adults in 2002 uh, reported 6.8 hours of sleep. They actually slept about six hours. People sleeping uh, um, five hours reported 6.3 hours of sleep. People sleeping seven hours reported 7.3. So self-reporting systematically over-report sleep levels. Be aware of that when you're doing your assessment. Sleep medication sucks. There's not a sleep medication out there that should be used for longer than a week, in my opinion. Um, uh, you know, like the benzodiazepines are the worst, but all of them are bad. They uh, increase your risk of uh, uh, suicide. They increase your risk of depression. They increase your risk of Alzheimer's. Um, don't take medications for sleep. Uh, like I said, the, the only... Uh, the only caveat to that that I ever find acceptable is using a long-acting benzo like clozapam for one week or less in people that have just experienced a severe emotional trauma like the death of a loved one and can't sleep. Uh, but even then, there are herbs that will work just as well 98.3% of the time. Sleep hygiene is important. You know, these are the things that we talked about just kind of in synopsis. So uh, you can go back and look at these. What did people a hundred years ago call exercise? They called it life. And uh, so lack of exercise can cause fatigue and over exercise can cause fatigue. We are designed to move, not sit on our butts. We're designed to walk, not sprint. Um, Amish men get an average of about 18,000 steps a day. Amish women, an average of about 14,000 steps a day. We can assume from their lifestyles that people a hundred years ago averaged about that many steps a day. The average American male walks 5,340 steps and the average American female walks 4,912 steps a day. And uh, the average American is sedentary by definition of steps per day. Um, my wife got me a step counter for Christmas and I strapped it on my first day and went about my normal day at the office and I got home, you know, like 5.30, 6 o'clock and looked down or, or plugged it in and uh, had walked like 4,400 steps that day. And I thought, oh shit, um, I had no clue because like... I pace when I talk on the phone and uh, when I teach, I carry my laptop around and I pace and, and, you know, I thought I was getting in fairly adequate, but no, it was totally sedentary. Um, so I took it off and then we moved to the mountains a few months later and I put it on uh, recently on just an average day on the mountain and uh, it recorded uh, 12,000 steps a day and uh, um, we're on a mountain so we're up and down hills so it recorded in addition to 12,000 steps a day the equivalent of about like 46 flights of stairs and I thought oh well that's why I feel better and uh, I can walk up the hill without being winded now is uh, that's the amount of activity that my daily life um, takes so the right amount of, uh, of nourishment and exercise, not too much, not too little, is the safest way to help, says Hippocrates. Um, ideal exercise, if you're in shape and exercise doesn't cause uh, muscle fatigue, is uh, a sprint a week, you know, high intensity uh, interval training is great. Find a good trainer uh, if you're not in shape. So, you know, if, if don't try like a couch potato to 5k by yourself. 
Um, if you're in America, there's no regulation of trainers and you can get certification from some institutes online with, you know, a minimal amount of, of actual training. So if you're in America, the Czech Institute certified trainers, even level one Czech trainers uh, are really competent, but a level, you know, two or three Czech trainer is amazing. Level four and uh, Czech starts, if they're an old Czech, they're great. Level four, the new Czechs, he started to get into some weird shit and um, away from the training aspect and the level four training. Anyway, um, low level aerobic activity, three to five hours a week of things that you enjoy. Find something fun, get a pet, take them for a walk. Uh, pick up a frisbee and go to a park and throw it at a random person. Either they'll either they will catch it and play frisbee with you, or it will hit them and you can laugh and apologize and pick up your frisbee and throw it at somebody else. Um, find something entertaining that you enjoy and do it regularly. Mark Sisson has a nice free ebook called the Primal uh, Blueprint Fitness or Primal Fitness Blueprint. I'm not sure how you what the, that order is supposed to be. Stress is another common factor in um, in uh, fatigue, and uh, we could talk about stress management and botanicals for stress for weeks and weeks. Uh, there's this cute book called Mindful Monkey Happy Panda, and I think you can probably YouTube and somebody will read it for you. But it epitomizes the type of meditation that I prefer called mindfulness-based stress reduction, where you're not meditating upon verbiage, but you're meditating upon your senses and you're you're becoming fully present and aware of the of the present moment. So uh, that's a really helpful way. Um, there is a oh, Dartmouth University has a whole web page full of downloadable guided meditations that are free that you can send your clients to um, to download themselves. I burn them on CDs for my clients. I'm kind of appalled at the number of people that don't have a CD player or don't understand what I'm doing when I'm giving them a CD, especially younger people. But um, Nevertheless, I, I burn a CD of meditation uh, that has a, a six-minute morning meditation and a 30-minute progressive muscular relaxation um, for any of my clients that are experiencing stress. They're downloaded from the Dartmouth website. Uh, they're, they're really nice. There are some nerve tonics that increase your capacity to deal with daily stressors. These are not sedatives, although at high doses, scutellaria can be a sedative, and at high doses, damiana can be a sedative. Um, skullcap, the fresh tincture, uh, I think probably any of the scutellarias work. I've used a few of them. I, uh, the Lateraflora fol lateral fol lateral is the most commonly grown one and the one that I've used the most, but Integrifolia grows all over the South, and I've used that interchangeably works great. Uh, Howie Brownstein, who loves the skull cap, says that the short uh, desert skull caps are, are much stronger. Um, so he's, he's the one that started calling them mad dog skull caps back in the 80s, even though that was a common name for all of the skull cap family. Uh, so skull cap is my favorite. Um, uh, followed. So skull cap is kind of neutral. It's not really that cooling, not really that warming, slightly cooling. Um, but not enough to overcool somebody, um, and it's relaxing. Uh, Damiana is, while it's bitter, is a little on the warming side, in my opinion. I like Damiana as a tea. I like Skullcap as a fresh tincture. I never use milky oat seeds because I react to it. I cross-react to it with my gluten allergy. Um, St. John's Wort interferes with so many medications that you have to, like, if somebody's on a medication, don't give them St. John's Wort. Uh, borage tincture is a really nice one. Sage, common kitchen sage, salvia officinalis is a really nice nerve tonic. All of these increase your capacity to deal with the everyday stress. There are a handful of nerve relaxants, and, and some of these are dose dependent, you know, like the borage um, and the skull cap. The bigger doses are more sedative, so a bigger dose of skull cap would be five milliliters is more sedative versus a, a two to three milliliter dose, which is more nerve tonic. Um, 
these are all, and this is a picture of mimosa flowers, by the way, one of my Al Albizia jubilorensis, one of my favorite um, uplifting, relatively heady uh, nerve relaxants. So all of these are options, and uh, what I recommend is uh, choose these based on their traditional energetics, not based on their chemical constituents, because the nervous system is probably the most poorly understood when it comes to how herbs interact. So when you see something that says C, that means cooling, D means drying, and R means relaxing. Relaxing is good. We want all of these because they're relaxing. Um, if you have a pale tongue, don't choose something that's cooling. Choose something that's warming. If you have a bright red tongue, don't choose something that's warming. Choose something that's cooling. Uh, if your tongue is uh, dried out and cracked, don't choose uh, one of these that say D for drying. Choose one that says M for moistening, or at least one that doesn't say drying. Um, you know, if your uh, tongue is uh, very moist, then verbena officinalis, uh, I, I actually, verbena hostata, um, or verbena brasiliensis, I use them all interchangeably. I prefer the, Brazil, uh, the verbena brasiliensis um, because it's what grows prolifically in my uh, area, in, well, on my property in Alabama. I think it's an amazing uh, bitter tonic. Uh, I make a Soxlet extract of it, and you know, one or two drops is either going to relax you or make you vomit. It's really potent medicine if it's prepared properly. There are a number of endocrinological um, uh, causes of fatigue. Oh, okay. So, Chinese skull cap, uh, the root is what's used in Chinese skullcap. And the root is not very relaxing. Now, the root is an amazing uh, anti-inflammatory, you know, the root works on uh, of the Chinese skullcap and maybe the root of the American skullcaps. They've never been tested. But the, the root has um, bicolin in it, which is uh, a hepatoprotective for the liver, though it has to be extracted in alcohol. It's not super water-soluble, so that eh, may be for the liver. But what bicolin does really well is uh, uh, inhibits quorum sensing in uh, microbial uh, colonies called biofilms. And uh, so I love Chinese skullcap for uh, chronic infections, uh, especially where, you know, they're entrenched and, and nothing is really working because it's probably the planktonic form of bacteria act totally differently, totally different than the, um, than the colonies of bacteria than the biofilms do. And uh, Bicolin works really well as a biofilm disruptor by inhibiting quorum sensing. So I prefer the aerial parts, the above ground parts of uh, the American skullcap for relaxing and the root of the Chinese skullcap for inflammation and infection. And it has several uh, nice anti-inflammatory compounds in addition to its role with the immune system. So thyroid disorders are a big uh, underdiagnosed cause of uh, fatigue, um, and uh, I teach a big long class on this. But but basically, one in five or more women um, will uh, develop hypothyroidism in their life. About ten percent of women over sixty have clinical or subclinical hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism causes not just fatigue, but uh, the most common, these are all symptoms, uh, well, there's a few signs on here. So loss of the outer third of the eyebrows, and remember to ask if they pluck so you don't make a misassessment. Um, weakening of uh, the fingernails, press their fingernail with your fingernail. If their fingernail is soft, then thyroid is the first place that I look. Uh, hair loss cold intolerance, you know. Uh, so uh, do you prefer winter or summer? I prefer summer. Um, in the wintertime, do you have a hard time heating up? Yes, I can never get warm. Okay, it's either anemia or hypothyroidism. Maybe autonomic nervous system stuff going on uh, from B vitamin deficiency or from some, you know, other weird thing. But Low thyroid and uh, hypothyroidism and anemia are the two most common causes of cold intolerance. 
The top 10 symptoms are fatigue, poor concentration, difficulty losing weight. Although I see a lot of people with hypothyroidism, especially the early stages of Hashimoto's, that don't have weight problems at all. My wife um, never had weight issues, and uh, her thyroid her, her thyroid peroxidase antibodies were greater than 3,000, and her thyroid globulin antibodies were greater than 1,000. Uh, worst case of Hashis I've ever seen. And, you know, her TSH was over 30 and uh, anyway, uh, nasty, even though she uh, and she didn't have issues with weight. Uh, wake up feeling tired. So anemia, hypothyroidism and sleep apnea are the three common causes of fatigue upon waking. And they're fairly easy to differentiate. Bloating, imagine that. Bloating, gut disorders going along with thyroid, who to thunk it? Irritability, anxiety, run down, joint pain and stiffness. You don't say that 64% of people with hypothyroidism report systemic inflammation causing joint pain and stiffness. I wonder how they're related. Uh, loss of outer third of the eyebrows, dry skin, soft, brittle fin uh, fingernails. Um, there is a double wrinkle right over your thyroid, and you will probably not notice it unless it becomes poofy or puffy between the two wrinkles that run right across the thyroid. And that's, in, in my opinion, one of the best indicators of hypothyroidism and a very early indicator of the immune attack on the thyroid that causes up to 90% of hypothyroidism. Uh, the side effect of the immune attack is, uh, you know, localized lymphatic stagnation, creating this kind of puffy swelling between the double wrinkles that run across the thyroid. So I teach thyroid classes. Uh, and I can sit in a classroom of 100 people and go down the aisle and pretty reliably identify people that, well, I can 99% of the time identify people that have Hashimoto's and don't know it. And most of the time identify people that are medicated for um, hypothyroidism. So they don't have the loss of the outer third of the eyebrows and they don't have soft and brittle fingernails, but they're not dealing with the autoimmune attack. And so it's still presenting as that uh, double line across the neck. You have two symptoms, uh, two choices when uh, you are faced with symptoms of low thyroid. You either treat the person like they have low thyroid, which means treat them like they have an autoimmune disorder, clean up their diet, probably good for them even if it's not caused by an autoimmune disorder. Or you can run a comprehensive thyroid panel. Comprehensive thyroid panel is more than just the thyroid. You're checking the antibodies. You're checking the ferritin, making sure nothing funky is going on. And since anemia is the most common, uh, commonly mistaken cause of fatigue and cold intolerance, I always throw a ferritin and B12 level in with a thyroid panel. Lots of things affect the thyroid. Uh, um, including uh, that systemic inflammation that we were talking about that occurs from uh, uh, food allergies, gut dysbiosis, fatty acid imbalances, nutrient deficiencies. I'm going to teach a free class uh, eventually on systemic um, causes of systemic inflammation and how they manifest throughout the body. Diabetes is another uh, endocrine disorder that causes fatigue. Classic symptoms of diabetes are frequent urination, increased thirst, and increased hunger. But one of the first symptoms of uh, diabetes is actually uh, fatigue. Um, there's type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Uh, uh, both are beyond the scope of this class to cover in detail, but the most common type of, di of diabetes that causes fatigue is type 2 diabetes. I mean, if you have type 1 diabetes, you probably know it. You probably aren't going to be going to an herbalist unless you're a primary care listening, in which case you already know how to identify uh, type 1 diabetes. So um, here are my functional blood sugar ranges. Uh, uh, I, I really like even more narrow ranges than this. I basically think that um, healthy plasma glucose should be about 81 to 87, but I give uh, the, the more exaggerated range of 75 to 89-ish. Um, and if you're 90 or over and you're not on a ketogenic diet, then I'm concerned. 
So if your blood sugar is 95 and you come to me and you're not on a ketogenic diet, then uh, I'm going to talk with you about food allergies that might be spiking cortisol. That's, you know, that cortisol insulin teeter totter. And I'm going to be talking with you about high carb foods and how to increase nutrient density. And I don't think everybody should be on a low carb diet. I don't think everybody should be on a ketogenic diet, moderate carb intake of, um, you know, 150 grams a day for somebody that uh, is relatively athletic, 100 grams a day for a couch potato or somebody trying to lose weight, more than adequate at balancing blood sugar ranges in that pre-diabetic 90 to 110 range. These are not the official ranges, by the way. The official ranges are pre-diabetes is like 110 to 126 and diabetes is 126 and over. Um, which I think is completely absurd because once your fasting blood sugar is at 110, then uh, you're experiencing daily increases of greater than 140. And 140, the longer you're, uh, the longer during the day that you spend above 140, your blood sugar spends above 140, the faster you die. It's as simple as that. And uh, so that's why I don't recommend six meals a day and I don't recommend snacking is because I want that blood sugar to, you know, spike one hour after a meal uh, at no less than a hundred, at, at no more than 130. And I want it back down to 10% of fasting at two hours and uh, back down to uh, stabilized level within three hours because I don't want you over, you know, that 140 mark. Um, very much of the day at all. Lots of people are obese and obesity and metabolic syndrome uh, create fatigue. Okay? And uh, that's something that we have to address at a dietary level, at, at a social level, at a, at a societal level. I mean, the fact that our government subsidizes the production of, uh, of uh, calorie dense nutrient poor foods so that bullshit is cheap to eat is just I, I i get so angry and worked up when i think about that um so you know I, that's why i think that and uh, you know the uh in the French Renaissance, one of the popular ideas amongst doctors was that uh, doctors have a moral obligation to be uh, social advocates and lawyers for the poor. And so this is why I think that everybody interested in healing uh, must absolutely work within their community um, and, and branch out to try to change some of these absurd policies that are destroying uh, our, our people, our culture. So chronic fatigue isn't new and uh, chronic fatigue is an exacerbation of fatigue. Basically, if, um, if you can't recover with rest and it goes uh, for longer than six months is considered chronic fatigue, but it's not new. You know, they called this, uh, de Costa syndrome and they called this neurasthenia, and, uh, you know, for about 50% of people with chronic fatigue in a large primary study in Britain, about 50% uh, of the people attributed their fatigue to mainly psychological causes. Um, 60 to 80% of people with chronic fatigue have, a, have some sort of psychiatric illness. Um, in one study, psychiatric diagnosis was found in 74% of over 400 patients uh, who presented with chronic fatigue clinic. <clears throat> so when you've ruled out everything else, and uh, there's stuff on that you know breakdown that we didn't have a chance to cover tonight, but when you've ruled out everything else and you're still feeling fatigued, find a good counselor to refer people to or go to a good counselor yourself. Um, there are physical symptoms of depression that people can experience without experiencing the normal cognitive symptoms of depression. And the depression, you know, I, I'm, it's not monamine hypothesis depression. This is not go to your doctor and get an SSRI. This is dig for the cause of your systemic inflammation that's inhibiting the neocortex from, uh, you know, turning off the stress response, which is the big cause of uh, depression. Uh, take some some saffron, 
you know, um, which is an amazing, it's been shown to be better than uh, antidepressants. Find a counselor, find somebody that does cognitive, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, find somebody that does EMDR if you're experiencing trauma. There's lots of, of really great therapies out there. Um, and you as a practitioner can help with that process because sometimes people just need someone to listen to them and to tell them that they should take a vacation. I had a client with malignant hypertension and uh, she was on uh, three medications uh, and uh, still had malignant hypertension and uh, her hypertension went away completely every weekend and came back every Monday morning. She actually had to not take medication on the weekends because it would drive her blood pressure too low. And uh, she needed somebody to tell her that, you know what, that job's not worth your health. Uh, and uh, she quit and uh, her blood pressure problems went away. Uh, within, within two weeks, her blood pressure was completely normalized. So uh, practice the art of compassionate listening. We're all in this together. Um, as, uh, as, you know, as being human, uh, we're, we're all in this together. And, uh, so when you sit down with somebody, you know, give them space to share their story, tell, you know, tell you all about their, it's, the story is a big part of, uh, uh, people's healing process, creating the story and expressing the story. As long as they don't get hung up in the story, it's fine. So uh, give them space and uh, tell them they need a vacation or tell them they need to get rid of their, you know, stressful job. Work on the root causes of uh, everything. So uh, I know we have a lot more that we could talk about, but um, I'm going to open it up to questions. You can type into the chat box and uh, hang around a little bit to answer those. And then we will call it a night. I hope you've all enjoyed thus far the um, the differentials on fatigue that I presented. So does anybody have uh, any questions? Okay. Ooh, coconut oil, body butter, magnesium oil. Heck yeah. Let's see. Okay, if no questions, thank you so much for attending and assuming that this recording, uh, um, that this presentation actually got recorded and I'm not sure if that happened or not, then I will have this posted within the next couple of days for everyone to review. So thank you all and uh, good night.